uh, I thought uh, today uh, I just wanted to start with a um, just just a little bit of background on where we where we want to go today. I know that there's been a lot going on in the news um, about testing. Most of us uh, are not didn't start uh, a few weeks ago knowing much about testing, um, and we've all probably become a lot more interested in the last uh, last last couple of weeks uh, and. So I thought that, uh, uh, and we've, we've tried to invite people that are really expert also on testing uh, to this call so that uh, we'd have a mixture of people, some of whom are, are uh, have, have just begun doing research on testing issues and some of which have done it uh, for years and are, are really quite expert. And uh, so uh, uh, the format was to start with a, uh, some discussion about the testing technology from people that uh, know the most about it and then have people uh, perhaps, you know, ask and, and, and probe some of the experts that will be on the call about that. And then from there, we'll move on to some of the other issues uh, relating to things like uh, patent landscape, public funding, uh, policies on access and affordability and things that we, uh, and, and whatever we know about pricing, which is, you know, we'll, we'll sort of see what happens. There'll be people here from uh, different countries. Um, we're supposed to have uh, 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 <clears throat> Uh, Anita Sands from the WHO here. Is she is she on the call right now? Um, is, is, is Anita is um, Anita Anita join join us yet? Uh, Mercedes uh, Perez. Are you, uh, Laura um, Laura Vo Vo uh, Laura, I, I'm not sure if I got your name right. Do we have you on the call? We've got quite a few people on the call. I'm going to see if I can find. Um, uh, do we have uh, uh, Cassandra Kelly uh, Cerno on the call? You guys are putting me at a disadvantage here. These, these, I'm calling out all the experts who are supposed to be starting the conversation here on the technologies. Um, Louise, are you are you uh, can you can you kind of weigh in here a second? Yeah, maybe we can ask if Terry Rovers is in the call. Louise gave me a list of uh, about seven people or eight people that are really good uh, experts on the technology, and we're calling all seven of them out. And Louise, if none of them show up, I'm going to be pretty angry at you. Uh, this is Cassandra from Find. I'm I'm online. I'm not sure if I'm one of the ones being called out or not, but I'm here. Yes, you are actually. Yeah, Cassandra. I was wondering if uh, if you could start the discussion by giving people, um, and we'll try and track down some of the other, like the, some of the people from WHO and uh, Terry Robertson and uh, and uh, Stin from MSF. But why don't you start and give people just just kind of a basic overview of the different kinds of tests that are out there and the pluses and minuses of the various tests. And also uh, some comments on what's, you know, what, what the R&D situation looks like in terms of tests. Sure, no problem. So a couple of resources I can point you to right from the beginning. Um, well, let me just back up a second. So I'm Cassandra Kelly Serino. I'm the Director of Emerging Threats at the Foundation for Innovative New Diagnostics in Geneva, Switzerland. We're a nonprofit foundation that works on developing diagnostics and ensuring implementation uh, for a whole suite of diseases ranging from HIV, TB, the neglected tropical diseases, antimicrobial resistance, malaria, fever, and now, um, well, under my program is antimicrobial resistance and pandemic preparedness. So, up until a couple months ago, I had my hands full. Now we've got COVID on our, on it on top of it. So. We're working across uh, several different initiatives right now, looking at what the pipeline looks like from a diagnostic perspective. On our website, we have a diagnostic pipeline tracker, which has over 500 different diagnostics listed that are commercially available already. We're also then evaluating, doing independent evaluations of over 300 of those. Uh, we have them prioritized. So the first 100 are going to be evaluated um, and they've already started. We've started doing the manual molecular assays. There's also automated molecular assays that are on the deck. And we're starting to do the antigen RDTs, 
the antibody RDTs and the antibody ELISAs. On the website too, you can find, if you go to finddx.org, we have an actual COVID-19 microsite. And on there, there's a lot of different resources, one of which is um, a description of the different kinds of diagnostics that are available. And it's, it's just a good, it's a good sort of representation of the different kinds of diagnostics that I'll walk you through right now. There's molecular tests, which of course are looking at the genomic material from the virus itself. They have to be taken through a nasal swab. There's two different mechanisms. One is a manual molecular test, so you have to actually do a, an independent extraction procedure to get the nucleic acid out. Then you put it into another platform and you do the PCR, and then that goes on an instrument. So there's, when we're looking at it, you've got four steps, the sample collection, the extraction, the amplification, and then the detection. That requires a laboratory, obviously, it requires quite a substantial amount of training and infrastructure uh, to be able to do this in a high throughput setting. Then there's automated systems, if you're familiar at all. I'm sorry, I'm not sure of the audience. I don't know if this is extremely boring or if it's too over the top, but there's automated molecular systems, which are cartridge-based, essentially. If you think about the simplest ones, you take a swab, you put the swab into a buffer, buffer goes into the cartridge, cartridge goes in the machine. I like to call them chocolate bar machines because you just put them in, you come out, the result comes out. Um, those require, obviously, the instruments. And right now with the travel restrictions globally, we're looking for low middle income countries anyhow. Um, we're not really able to go and introduce new platforms into laboratories. They don't have the capacity to uptake it. We don't have the technologies already there. Then that means we need to have a distribution network. We need to have um, supply and we also need to have the training and the um, servicing put in place before we can start work, which is just right now it's, it's not possible. So we're looking to make sure that we evaluate a range of different diagnostics so that countries can use the ones that are highest performing on the platforms they already have in their labs so that they know that their staff are trained. The rapid diagnostic tests, so these are lateral flow strip tests that look like pregnancy tests. These are the ones that are very decentralizable. You don't need a laboratory infrastructure. You take your sample. In the case of an antigen RDT, again, it's a nasal swab because you're looking for viral particles. You put that onto the lateral flow test strip, and that test strip then gives you a result of positive or negative with a band or no band within about 10 to 15 minutes. The issue is that they're never going to be as sensitive or specific as a molecular test. So the sensitivity and specificity at best we're likely going to see is somewhere around 90% sensitive, 80% specific potentially. Uh, we're doing those evaluations now. Some of the ones you've heard about in the media are even worse. They could be 30%. So it's extremely critical that we evaluate these tests so that we understand their performance. Otherwise, we are actually going to do more harm by using them until we understand if they work or not. The antibody-based tests, these are the ones that are going to test whether or not you've ever seen the virus. Doesn't mean that you're actively infected. We, we can't know that. But it does mean that after a certain amount of time, after you've been exposed, your body mounts an immune response. And from a drop of blood or a venous puncture, we can actually detect the level of IgM and IgG. We don't know yet whether or not that means you're immune. Um, so that's a different question. And it's extremely important that we, we understand that's a different question. Because if you make the immediate leap to a positive antibody test, meaning you're immune, and you make decisions about putting people into high risk situations again, you could be wrong. They may not be immune. They may be open for reinfection. And if you don't believe that that's happening, they could then be transmitting again. So this is where the science needs to catch up. Unfortunately, uh, we need to really understand the course of infection and the immunity. But right now, what I can tell you is that there's lots of different, there's over uh, 200 antibody based RDTs available on the market. Um, we're not entirely sure that the performance is going to be where we need them to be. We're doing those evaluations right now. The challenge a lot with the diagnostics is they come to market very, very quickly, but they're not necessarily the best performing ones. Those require some R&D time. And that's going to obviously take about six to 12 months to get other products into the space. The first products that have been coming on the market have been predominantly based off SARS-CoV-1, so the SARS outbreak in 2008. Um, and so from those circulating antibodies and antigens, that's where a lot of these uh, diagnostics have been based off of, which is, is okay because there is cross-reactivity. 
but it's not great in terms of specificity. So um, that, those, that's some of the challenges. Those are the main anti, anti, uh, sorry, diagnostics. There's also one more. There's an antibody-based test that would be done in the laboratory called an ELISA. That's much more specific, of course, because it's laboratory-based. Uh, it takes more time, however, and takes the infrastructure and capacity to be able to run that. So all of these um, from different perspectives have different sensitivity specificities, ease of use, which is critical, cost, which is highly variable across these, and then the supply chain of the reagents and the technologies that go around the use of the tests is critical because we do have uh, global demand that's, that's exceeding global supply. Can you explain the differences really between uh, tests that you use for influenza, uh, sort of the seasonal variety, and what you and what's going on with COVID nineteen? So seasonal influenza tests are, are actually quite specific to influenza, um, and so they they're usually off of the same premise of the ones that we're trying to evaluate and, and use for COVID. So there's molecular based tests, so PCR based tests. Um, and those, you would probably want to think about it more in terms of a panel, where you might have a test that would be specific for influenza, and then you also have it coupled with a test that's specific for coronavirus. And that way, if a patient is presenting with an, you know, just a general respiratory infection and a fever, you would be able to differentiate. And there are some groups that are doing panels to be able to, respiratory panels. A good example is one called BioFire, which has about 23 different re respiratory pathogens in one test. Um, the challenge for that is they're about $250 a test to run a 23 test panel. So they're extremely expensive. So they're not things that get run for every single person that's walking into a clinic. Um, and as we look, there's also the rapid test that you can get for influenza and strep at your doctor's office. And those are the same technologies that I was just explaining, the little pregnancy strip tests essentially, there's some variations for coronavirus, um, but the coronavirus is ones that are again meant to be specific for coronavirus. So they use slightly different reagents that are only going to be expressed if you have a coronavirus infection. So we would hope that we would not see anything come up positive on an influenza test if you're actually coronavirus positive. We would hope that they would be specific enough. And there's enough evidence I think out there that the influenza tests aren't going to cross-react and inherently pick up coronavirus. Uh, can you also just uh, uh, reflect a little bit on the, the, the cost of and complexity of the platforms to support different kinds of tests? Sure. So, I mean, there's a wide range, but if we're talking about um, if we're talking about manual molecular assays, so these are the ones where you need to buy an extraction kit, which can vary, but it's somewhere between, let's say the average is about $5 per test just to extract the material. It can be a little lower, it can be a little higher, but I'll just give you some averages. And then you need to also then run the assay itself. And that assay, let's say it's on average about $15 per assay. So you're now at about $20 to do one single test. And then you also need the platform and the platform can range, but they're in the 20 to $40,000 uh, range likely for a unit. There's some that are much cheaper and they're very small, but they don't have high throughput. So you're going to balance that out. You also need the laboratory infrastructure, the biosafety cabinets and, and the trained personnel because each step is individually manual. If you're looking at the automated uh, molecular systems, the individual instruments themselves are again around $20,000. They, they can range, there's some that are much higher cost than that, but generally speaking, somewhere in the twenty dollars to $50,000 range. And then the price per kit, again, can be widely variable. Um, they can be as low as maybe $25 all the way up to $250. Well, when, when you say uh, the cost per kit, Mm -hmm. That's per test. Per, per test itself. And when you, say, when you say the cost, you mean that's the price that the vendors uh, charges or that's the cost of making the kit? No, no, that's the price of uh, that you're going to be charged for it minimally because then there's also distribution costs. So some, some countries don't get that price. They get that price with a 30 or 40% markup. Um, uh, I, I, what I, I was going to call in a, a couple of people and then sort of open it up a bit for more discussions, but I'd like to ask Anita Sands uh, uh, just to, uh, to make some comments right now. She works on uh, 
the issue of uh, post-market surveillance of of, uh, of uh, testing devices. Um, Anita, could you uh, offer a few comments on this? Yeah, sure. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks very much for the invitation to today's meeting. Uh, so yes, I work in uh, a team in WHO which is called Incidents and Substandard Falsified Medical Products. So we deal with once the products are on the market, so I'm the lead for diagnostics and medical devices, um, and we're more uh, interested in this phase of once products are out there on the market, um, are they still performing well? Are they performing in accordance with what the manufacturer um, has said about their sensitivity and specificity, for example? Um, so as Cassandra mentioned, there are many, many um, tests actually already available. Um, we don't seem to sort of suffer from there not being enough products. Whether or not the products are, um, are good quality and performing well, well, that's another thing. And I do think that we kind of need to split those two things apart. One is, um, you know, does the product that's um, presented to you, either a molecular test, like a, you know, a PCR test or a serology RDT test, you know, what our team is trying to do is to give you the kind of tools to be able to determine, you know, does this product, this diagnostic do what the manufacturer intended it to do? So if the manufacturer says the sensitivity of my product is 99%, the specificity is 100%, um, we're giving you the tools and the mechanism to be able to help try to identify if that's actually the case. And if it's not the case, that you would report that as a complaint and start off a cycle where of feedback back to the manufacturer about the real life use of their product. As Cassandra mentioned, um, generally this first wave of diagnostics that comes out, um, particularly in response to uh, epidemics like this one, they're very much done as quickly as they can and um, based as we know on the previous SARS um, outbreaks. Um, and the manufacturers actually, you know, will have done a limited validation of their own, um, but there are not been so many um, independent evaluations and neither full scale kind of use of the products. And so the manufacturers actually are relying on us to be able to collect data and bring it back to them. They actually want to know if their test is not working well. Um, you're helping them in that way. Um, now we wouldn't off, we wouldn't work this way in a non um, a non pandemic um, space. So we wouldn't kind of use this same thing for like a HIV rapid test, for example. This is very specific to these kind of um, tests that we're working with for COVID. So just to say that in, in um, the work that we do, we have a global um, monitoring and surveillance system, and we are already starting to pick up uh, reports of falsified COVID tests. We've had falsified PCR tests. We have seen um, many um, rapid tests that are coming into markets that we wouldn't say they're falsified, but we would say that their provenance is unknown. We, we certainly see that their um, performance is unknown. Um, but I think what Cassandra kind of alluded to is there's this difference between, you know, is this test good quality and performing according to what the manufacturer says? And that's kind of separate from is antibody a useful marker um, when you're trying to diagnose COVID? And I think the current evidence um, that we've seen um, is that it, it isn't. It could be used in a research setting and maybe in time this will change. So, um, from the WHO perspective, um, we work pretty closely with the pre-qualification program and so they're doing emergency use listing procedure for products. Um, from the substandard falsified side where I sit, I look at both those EUL products, but we also are interested in any products um, that are reported to us by either regulators or even by whistleblowers or people that are out there in labs using the products. Um, we've just released um, an information notice um, last week and actually today, I was just about to post the English and French versions. We're trying to get as many UN languages so we can kind of tell end users in laboratories or users of diagnostics what to look out for, um, how to um, be able to identify if the product you're using is substandard, um, meaning it's got poor quality, uh, poor performance, or if it's falsified. Because we do know that such an enormous demand for tests does bring um, people with less scrupulous um, motives out of the woodwork. And um, so there's quite a bit of work on that. Also to say WHO, we have specific guidance on post-market surveillance of IVDs in English, French, and in Russian. Um, we'll obviously share these with you afterwards and share you the, the page on our website where we list any product um, recalls that we become aware of. Uh, we haven't had any just yet, um, but we are working through a number of incidents um, 
particularly ones we've picked up in the media ourselves, actually, we've been very proactive to go out there and try to um, um, understand how, how, how well the products may be working. But I think our main focus is trying to sort of understand false negative rates, false positive rates, um, unreturnable result rates, all of these factors that have um, an impact on the bottom line of health budgets. You know, if you've got false positive results in your retesting, retesting, and you're talking about $20, $30 a test, that's got quite an implication. If the instrument you're running like, you know, an automated NAP platform has a 5% invalid rate, that's an additional 5%. So the cost per test is important, but it's there's a lot of those other costs which um, which we look at. So um, it's not exactly post-market surveillance, but it, we get that information from post-market surveillance. Um, I might just leave it there. If everyone has questions, um, I'm happy to answer. Um, uh, <clears throat> so uh, do, do, do you, uh, in terms of the surveillance, I mean, sort of when, when, did, when were you able to sort of, what was the sort of first wave of uh, data you started to get? Um, much of, most of it was anecdotal. Um, we've spent the last five years trying to train up uh, people in laboratories, so testing, testing providers as well as NRAs, to be able to identify and document problems very well. What we found often is we don't have the lot number of products, we don't even have the exact name, we don't know exactly who was the supplier, we don't know the manufacturer often. So we'll see these reports of these tests don't work well, but in order to be able to investigate, well, what's the reason they don't work well? Was it the production site was not performing well and they didn't have an ISO 1385 standard? Or was it just that you know they've not chosen the right kind of um, targets in their PCR, for example? But if we don't have the exact name and we don't have the supply chain and we don't have that lot number, it's very hard. And as WHO, we contact manufacturers and say, well, what do you have to say? Um, but when it's a very anecdotal data source, that's really difficult. We find that people in labs are really often a little bit um, nervous, I would say, to report issues about diagnostics. They're very well conditioned to kind of think, oh, maybe it's an end user error and I've made an error. You may well have, but that doesn't mean we can't improve the product. Um, if the instructions are not clear, if the device is difficult to handle, um, feeding back that information might actually help improve the product in the future. If you can't use the touchpad, if you can't understand how to validate the run, this is all very important information. So at the moment, we're getting a lot of anecdotal and what we'd like to do is take that up a next level and make sure that the document, it just needs to be lot number, product number, uh, product code, the product name, and, and how did you actually know that there was a problem? Like, what was it that made you think that it was false negative or false positive? How, how, many, uh, how many vendors are you basically dealing with or products are you dealing with in terms of the things that you've actually been able to review or had, had feedback on? Uh, it's very few. We've probably had about, I would say, about seven or eight particular incidents have come to us. They're for, all, for different products, um, but you only need to go to the Find um, COVID Resource Centre there to see the amount of products that are available. If there's... I'd say there's probably upwards of two, 300 at the moment, which is across the PCR as well as the serology. And there's probably many more. Um, as I said, sometimes we're able to start to unpack these incidents and to find that there, there is a user error, but often it's because the instructions are not very clear. And we've noticed uh, with some of them, it's a lot to do with the um, collection device. So it's really important that the collection devices are the ones that are stated by the manufacturer of the product. Now, for an open system PCR, it's very hard to have that sort of information. Um, those kind of test extraction reagents, they wouldn't be validating it for this particular kind of, um, you know, all the different swabs you could have, nasal pharyngeal swabs and just straight nasal swabs and what have you. But we notice that also the media that they're transported in does have a dilutional effect. Um, and so some of the sensitivity, at least for one of them, and it, what we do believe is that one of it, it was actually due to a, a super dilution um, of the material in the swab, um, which meant it was just unable to be detected. Uh, I, I, I would like to, uh, we, we're seeing some questions on the chat here. Um, um, but before we go, go into that, I was going to just ask uh, three more people to make some comments on what other people have said and add a few comments and then open it up to the broader group for questions of the group. Uh, we have Michael uh, Carome from Public Citizen and uh, Terry Roberts from the International AIDS Society and uh, uh, Stint, is that right, from MSF um, and Mercedes uh, 
uh, Perez from uh, uh, the WHO Diagnostics uh, Essential Drug <laughs> So if we, if we, I, I could ask Michael if, if he just had a few comments. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I'm. I am not an expert like the ones who have just spoken on sort of the technologies of these devices, how they're validated. Um, you know, we have been pushing for a policy and and federal action that, in order to loosen the restrictions on social distancing and begin moving towards opening up some businesses that have closed down, having uh, appropriate testing on a massive scale, both to detect active infections uh, and trace their contacts is, is going to be essential. And so the types of tests that detect either antigen or the molecular uh, sequence of the virus is essential. We're not doing enough testing in the US. It, it needs to be scaled up probably five to tenfold on a daily basis. And until that happens, uh, we're, we're going to be stuck where we are and not be able to safely resume um, businesses that uh, eventually need to reopen. Mike, Michael, I think we're going to get into to the more policy uh, part of the second second part, but I just wanted to start with some of the um, some, some of the some, some of the uh, if uh, and we'll come back to this because what you're talking about is I think the reason why most people are on the call. Uh, but it, uh, uh, could, is is uh, is Terry Roberts on the call now? Hi, Jamie. Yes, I'm on. Uh, could you, could you, I, 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 I've got down in my notes that you, you might share some information about um, an, antigen and antibody combo test. Oh, so I, I think that uh, Cassandra already covered that extremely well in her introduction. From, from a technical point, I, I, I can't add anything to what Cassandra already said. Um, and, and we are all waiting on the WHO's guidance, which um, will be forthcoming on, on serology, particularly on the different use cases, um, but also on which tests would be used um, you know, in, in terms of the performance and quality. Um, be, because as, as Anita also very well explained, um, we do need to watch for and what sort of tests are being ordered and, and, and used on the market at the moment uh, to make sure that we're, we're actually not um, using tests that, that actually have no clinical value, either because the intended use has not been established or because the performance and quality is not established. And we don't know what the result actually means. Again, I'm just repeating what, what, what Cassandra and Anita already said. Um, in terms of supply, though, I think what would be helpful on this call is if we discuss the, the various options beyond the um, typical commercially available platforms, which go through a very traditional route of performance validation and, and quality assurance, um, because there's been a lot of uh, sort of ideas circulating about how testing can be expanded um, beyond what the FDA has has authorized certain laboratories to do, for example, in the US, but also applying to other countries, what could be authorized in a way that preserves a high standard of performance and quality. Um, but by other laboratories, number one, by other laboratories who, who would be able to perform testing, uh, other uh, accredited and reference and, and other national labs, um, university labs, for example, um, but then also in terms of reagents, um, how we make sure that these laboratories can procure quality assured reagents if they are building their own validated assays, um, whether using open systems, homebrew, homebrew tests, etc. Um, and I'd love to hear more from the WHO also how, what they would recommend in that regard to help countries plan that sort of thing. Um, on the supply side, though, it would be more about how to increase manufacturing capacity. Uh, of course, we don't want um, manufacturers repurposing manufacture, manufacture of other essential products that we need for HIV and TB and so on completely to COVID related products. But are there some other interesting ways um, we can repurpose or increase 
manufacturing capacity, um, also from, from other manufacturers that could switch to health products. All of this is an open question. And before we start pushing hard, uh, you know, uh, you know be, being good activists for, for various solutions, it would be great to have, to have an informed decision about what we want to push for. So again, it would be great for the WHO or others on the call to comment on that. Uh, 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 several people, uh, Heather, uh, Chase, and others have asked questions about some of the um, some some of the issues about manufacturing. Chase, uh, do you mind uh, asking your question um, that you raised? Yeah, and so sorry. I, just one more point would be to cover the potential of various countries to increase uh, local manufacturing of products where that infrastructure doesn't already exist. There are some countries like Brazil and so on who already have that capacity. But um, you know, beyond that, uh, much lower resource countries may, may, not, may just not be able to, to do that. So including that aspect in the discussion. Thanks. Yeah, Jamie, um, my question uh, really revolves around trying to provide a framework for some of us from Access to Medicines. Um, who are approaching these questions with the like generic uh, paradigm in mind and wondering how that translates to diagnostics. And I think with the um, nucleic acid testing, that answer is a bit different than it would be with the, the serological assays. But um, the, the question I posted in the chat is really I, it's to, to, to lead us towards that roadmap and helping us to understand um, Right. What would it look like to have some sort of um, open kit um, and what would be the barriers? I mean, I think that there's lots of manufacturing, regulatory and quality assurance barriers to uh, creating um, cr creating uh, kits that aren't directly from the same manufacturer as the, uh, as the platform, which is which is very common today. Um, so so I put that question in the chat. I don't know if anybody wants to give uh, to have a go at it, but um, I think it's a, a different set of questions uh, for what what the roadmap towards a um, towards something closer to a generic um, uh, a generic uh, let's say uh, active ingredient or a detecting agent uh, for for amino assays. But um, I just thought that that kind of discussion or that kind of technical background would be very useful for the discussion uh, on the policy side. I'd, I'd like to ask uh, Marcella followed by Bren and, and, and Dermot also to, to present their uh, questions. Start with Marcella. Uh, hi, everyone. Okay, so I put two questions in the in the chat. The first one was exactly related, well, try to relate to this question of uh, manufacturing capacities. I'm not really sure if WHO is doing this. Uh, I have not seen anything public, but maybe in the internal uh, documents or if there's anything that we can track so uh, exactly men uh, trying to track manufacturing capacities not only the ones that are actually producing but also the ones that are could start producing and uh, across uh, countries I know it's a very broad question but if there's anything that anyone is aware of uh, in that uh, in that sense I think it could be uh, really helpful to to share with uh, with everyone in this call and also regarding well international procurement uh, mechanism is if it has been any or if there's any mechanism that we can uh, track uh, which companies are actually selling which which uh, each one of the tests that are listed on the WHO page, uh, volumes, which countries are buying from who, uh, prices, I mean, any kind of uh, monitoring system that we can have this kind of information, I think would be uh, really important. I've been looking for it and I've not been able to find much. So if anyone knows, uh, please do, do share. And uh, well, the other question was not really related to the discussion. So maybe I will leave it for, for after. I don't know what you or if you want me to put that, uh, that question, it was more about uh, pathogens and benefit sharing. Um, I, I, if you don't mind, Marcel, go through like two more people and then, and then ask people to respond to the, um, to the questions from-, from Of course, I, I go back to the other one afterwards, not really related to the discussion. But those you. are really, I think questions on, those are great questions. And I think the, the one on the, um, uh, the, the, the benefit sharing protocol is really interesting too. Um, Bren? Am I pronouncing the name wrong? 
This is the ideal characteristics for the person. <laughs> Yes, hi, this is Bryn Gay from TAG. Um, I just had a question about, uh, I guess, directed to find and some of the diagnostics experts on the uh, panel about uh, what would be some of the ideal characteristics that we should be uh, focusing some of our R&D in. Um, if there's something missing in the pipeline, um, what, what are some of the, uh, the areas or the, the missing questions that you know, we want to understand, um, particularly if we're asking some of our governments to invest uh, some of the, the funding, um, you know, what, what, what might be some of the missing links that we want to invest in? And then there was sort of a clarification question about, um, I think it was said that um, an open system PCR platform has like sensitive, sensitivity and specificity issues. Um, so if that's the case and we are thinking about open kits, uh, open kits then um, what would be sort of the ways that maybe we could improve upon that or is it just a, you know, completely uh, impossible based on the science? Thank you. And then uh, German, you, 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 um, you have something in, in the same area? Yeah, thanks Jamie and thanks everybody. Um, it's been really interesting so far. I, I don't think that I have to speak a lot, but I'm just basically seconding Chase's question from conversations that I've seen play out and spoken to people in Ireland and the UK. Like it appears like the like this um, uh, the proprietary nature of the kind of testing platforms is an issue, and there was an indication that the like alternative versions of the cartridges could be manufactured at least from some people in authority in Ireland but that it would take a much longer period of time to do that because of the nature of the kind of protections around the cartridge um, uh, on the, within those platform setups uh, and yeah basically to ask it, the UK is a very confused picture so trying to figure out whether or not there is veracity in that perspective um, and essentially like reiterating uh, Chase's question as being a really great one to get an answer to. Darman, uh, could you just just be elaborate a little bit on the Ireland uh, capacity issue? So um, there were so I think some of us will have seen that in in the Netherlands there was the press from Parliament to remove kind of monopoly protections and open the kind of the trade secrets around the license buffer that was being used um, as the kind of extraction method before the use of the Roche testing kits. Um, similar conversation played out a little bit in Ireland, and one of the the, the assertion was made from somebody within the Irish health authorities was that actually the license buffer was not a problem. They were able to manufacture that themselves and they were doing that presently, that they would also be able to, um, to manufacture some of the um, bits that were missing from the, from, this, from, from, the kind of the, from the kit itself, like the second step, and I'm not a diagnostics expert, so my knowledge is being stretched here, and um, so that some of the component parts in the kit itself could have been manufactured by them and that they were considering it, but that it would take many months for them to do that because of the proprietary nature of the testing, um, the te proprietary nature of the testing um, uh, systems. So, um, yeah, I think it's essentially kind of reiterating um, what uh, Chase has said uh, in the question, I, I think would be helpful to get the answer to. Um, uh, could, uh, could find, um, um, get some response to some of these questions about the, about what type of things are possible in terms of having local manufacturing? Sure. Uh, this is Cassandra. I'm not sure what's happened to my video. So, yeah. so these are really, sorry. Oh, I'm just going to, someone, someone needs to mute their, their audio. Yeah. Tammy, is it? No. Okay. But somebody, okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. These are really great questions and they're difficult ones uh, to work through. But if I go back, let, uh, if I start with Chase's question and then uh, Dharma's question. So a lot of the reagents that we're talking about, you, it really, we have to be specific. So there's the open molecular systems. Those are kits that you can, you can buy. And if you want to buy a commercially available kit, then that's manufactured by the, by the commercial manufacturer. You can also make your own lab developed test to run an open um, PCR based assay. And that means that you're going to go to different individual manufacturers and buy the different components to be able to make your own test. That's what Terry was uh, referring to when she talked about the LDTs and the, the lab developed tests. 
those are not scalable. Those are going to be something that you're going to be able to do with one site or two sites. Um, you're really not going to be able to share those. They're not going to have quality control because you're going to do local quality control only. So from our perspective, in order to really support countries that don't have the capacity to make their own tests and you know that aren't high income, we really need access to well-controlled, good quality manufactured kits, which means that a lot of these are proprietary in some way, or at least they've been designed by a manufacturing company and, and that's why you're going to go to them to buy. For the automated systems, this is I think more where you were pushing on the, on the questions, there you've got IP, you've got actual patents around this. This isn't just a test, it's a, it's a plastic cartridge that's been specifically designed and engineered to fit into a unit. It has microfluidics and, micro, and handling, it has buffers and reagents that are, are loaded at very specific concentrations and recipes. So the companies themselves, currently there are no automated platform companies that have generic cartridges or generic assays that you could get from different manufacturers and put onto their system. There's some that are slightly open that you can design your own assay and put it in. Um, but for the major ones for, co for coronavirus, they've all come out with their own assays that are going to be closed and proprietary to be run on their systems. We have been speaking with them quite a bit in terms of how to increase their manufacturing capacity, but also about whether or not any of them are open to having you know, a tech transfer essentially happen so that we could manufacture some of the components of the tests with other manufacturers, as Terry mentioned. There are some uh, low middle income countries that do have the capacity to manufacture and produce their own supply. So we're trying to understand which companies are open to that approach so that we could help support more innovative manufacturing uh, ideas. There's a couple groups out of the UK that I'm sure you've heard about in the news where they do have that approach right from the beginning with some of their assays. They're not molecular. Uh, where they would actually be manufactured in a manufacturing site that's being set up in Senegal right now. Um, it's not going to be ready in the next couple of months, but that's one of the longer term plans that we have to try to work with different countries and different manufacturers to be able to essentially do, it's not really generic, it's still extremely specific, but at least it's sort of outside of the home-based manufacturing. Cassandra, could you, could you expand on the principles under the, the Senegal um, project, but also uh, on, on other, maybe other sort of tangible examples like what Blink had had in mind, just to give people a sense of what was in the works and maybe what we could expand and improve on for increasing capacity. Sure, thanks. Uh, the Senegal, is, so it's called Diatropiques and it's a, it's a public-private partnership, I guess you could call it, between uh, Fondation Merieu, uh, IPD Dakar, MoLogic, uh, Find, MSF, there's, there's several founding partners in there. Um, and some of, so the main crux of it is that there's been some technology transfer and physical technology. So manufacturing machinery has been transferred into a site that's been built in Senegal uh, to be able to then manufacture tests. And MoLogic is one of the companies that has agreed to be able to essentially transfer the manufacturing of some of their assays into the site in Senegal so that the cost is the cost structure is different and also the supply would be made available in Africa by Africa. Um, there's also uh, Fondation Medio in conjunction with Biomedio had some assays that they don't manufacture and market any longer so those are being transferred over as well because there is still a need in Africa and so that's where the manufacturing would be owned locally but tech transferred out of a different company coming out of a higher income. <laughs> It's not going to have the capacity at this stage to ramp up and do molecular. Molecular is uh, quite complex, and so it's just not there yet. And the first focus is on rapid diagnostic tests. The Blink reference uh, is a different approach from a company um, located in Germany, where what they had envisioned, and we're still working with them to see if we can get them, but they're not quite there, is to develop a low cost automated unit platform that would do molecular testing. The, the, tech, the way they're approaching the molecular testing is quite different. It's multiplex, so it's multiple pathogens, but they're individual, so you can actually pick and choose which ones you would put into any test for any patient, as opposed to being locked into 23 that are on this $250 panel. It's a bit more flexible. 
and their approach to this was that they would um, they would own the manufacturing of the instrumentation itself because there is legally a requirement for a manufacturer of record to be responsible for the function and for the post-market surveillance that Anita was explaining, but that they would open up the manufacturing of the cartridges and the development of tests to external partners. And they would do this essentially through bridging or um, you know, technology transfer through training material that would be provided to external partners to explain how to design a test that would then work with their system. And the way they built their software is that as you go through that development process, you're actually documenting everything from, an, from a regulatory standpoint so that at the end, you actually have a, com a compiled uh, document that can go for regulatory approval that bridges the, the development of the assay with the actual instrument itself that would still be owned by Blink be a hybrid application. This is really quite novel in the space for molecular and for diagnostics. It's not been done before, um, but it's something that we're, we've been exploring along with MSF uh, for several years now, trying to understand how can we change the paradigm about the ownership of the IP around some of these tests and how do we get to a much more flexible approach. We had also spoken with some other um, automated system manufacturers to see if they would essentially provide an empty plastic cartridge that could then be loaded with PCR reagents for an assay that a country decided was of importance to them. So our approach was to look at this first for loss of fever virus, which of course is not of any interest to any high income country, but is of significant interest to several countries in Africa. But because the volumes are so small, it was very difficult to convince any developer to go and make an assay at a cost that would be sustainable. So we had tried to undertake where the open cartridge essentially would be made available and then we would partner with other assay developers to put the assay on. Um, that unfortunately just hasn't moved forward due to the commercial company not being interested in pursuing. But we still think it's viable and we think that uh, in the case of a coronavirus outbreak, this would have been very, very um, it would have been timely because we would have had access to, con to automated extraction systems assays very quickly, which would have changed the capacity that even the highest income countries were suffering under for molecular testing. Cassandra, can, can I yeah. uh, just, just pose a follow-up on this? Uh, um, in the automobile sector, um, there was a, there was a, um, a, a period when companies, uh, you know, didn't want to, put seat belts or airbags or different things like that in cars, or there was like a problem of having um, uh, in, in recycled paper, there was a problem of, of, of companies just saying there wasn't a market for it. But at a certain point, a government procurement policy was organized in order to use the purchasing power of governments in order to shape uh, and change the market. So in the case of testing, would it be the case that if the government was to say that they would only that they would set aside a certain amount of the procurement budget for tests that involved um, open sourcing the cartridges, for example, or other critical things that would make it more competitive? So it wouldn't be like uh, having to buy ink from uh, HB for your inkjet printer or something like that, where you'd have a, a competitive market for some of the things that could be uh, where prices could go down or where there's a bottleneck in terms of the prices. If there was a an, a, uh, an agreement by uh, WHO members, the European Union, the U.S. government, or something like that, to sort of force, uh, you know, even without like compulsory licensing, if you just just said we would only buy from people a certain percent of our budget that went down that road, would that, in your opinion, um, uh, create a feasible path to creating a generics market? for some of the higher end uh, PCR type cartridges and stuff like that? It, it likely would. Um, my concern, of course, would just be around the quality. So if th these, are, these are highly sensitive assays, they're uh, very particular. So I think that there does need to be a shift in terms of pushing towards more open manufacturing and, and more open partnerships. And I think that shift is happening. I think if there was legislation or just a concerted agreement that you know priority uh, procurement was going to be given to companies that had a had a more open approach and had a more flexible manufacturing approach, I think that would obviously be very impactful. 
Um, and then it would just be um, making sure that we have the post-market surveillance happening and that we have quality products that are coming into the market, not very low quality products that are coming in at the lowest price. Uh, some of you, uh, I, I invite, uh, I invite uh, people to, a couple of people to jump in right now. I know that there, I know that there's follow-up questions by people. Uh, I've been trying to pick people that have uh, uh, mentioned things on the on, on the on the on the chat. I haven't gotten everybody, but I know that Cara and Brooke uh, both have questions, and maybe if Cara could ask hers and then Brooke. Or Brooke, go ahead. I think because I think Cara is. Well, uh, yeah. So, so my question is uh, about. Um, whether when we have these cartridge systems and they're dependent on the manufacturer's platform for actually reading, whether expanding the uh, cartridge manufacturing is actually going to be a solution uh, to the problem, it would suggest that there's underutilized capacity uh, in terms of you know the number of, of uh, cartridges running through the units at this time. And I just wonder if people think there's going to be a need for greatly increased uh, supply of the uh, machines as well. Kara, were you able to uh, grab the mic? You had this question about uh, characterized samples, which I don't, I don't really follow. So, if you could explain it. Um, maybe I could jump in to explain a little bit about what, what that may, perhaps means. Um, this is where it's really difficult when we jump from the pharmaceutical world into the diagnostics world because the, the types of tests we do to determine if a test is working well is slightly different. And um, what that was referring to was having a panel of characterised specimens that we know are definitively contain COVID virus and a panel of specimens that definitively contain um, antibodies to SARS COVID and ones that detect that have antigen. And so having a source of well characterized biological specimens that are either have the actual analyte, either the, the virus, like the, the nucleic acid or the antigen or the antibody, and also having a corresponding panel of negative specimens, but that come from the populations where the test is going to be used, is very valuable in being able to do an independent evaluation of the sensitivity and specificity um, of the product. Um, you, it's very hard to determine if it's the product sensitive if you don't have um, something with which you're comparing it against. And so um, at the moment, what is happening is um, certain institutions such as FIND are collecting those kind of, um, well, I don't know if I could say they're collecting, but um, maybe Cassandra would be better to uh, explain this, but certainly in the context of the pre-qualification program in the past. So we don't use pre-qualification for these kind of products. We use a different process, eWell, but for pre-qualification in the past, we've collected these large panel of sera for HIV, for hepatitis, for malaria, it's a very common way that we um, independently evaluate tests. We also ask that the manufacturer do the same thing and then we do an independent to, to kind of um, double check that. Um, but I might also make the case here that we need um, access to um, quality control materials. And that actually gives the end user quite a bit of um, autonomy to be able to um, know how well their tests. So for example, for a PCR test, if they were to have a vial of material that we knew the exact number of copies of the SARS-CoV virus is in there, that they could be running a dilution of that every day and be able to look at repeatability and reproducibility over time to see um, if there is anything that is um, maybe going wrong with the assay or the way it's being tested. So there's one thing is the panels for an evaluation. The other thing is actually quality control material, and that's very useful for post-market surveillance. This is Cassandra, I would just jump in that exactly Anita, that this is critical. Um, and there's several groups that are leading on this front across development of molecular standards um, and panels of, of, of samples, as well as reference standards that are going to be able to be shared out. It takes a couple of months to actually get them made and at scale. 
So we're expecting to see the first couple hopefully come out in the next uh, two to three months. And then there's also, uh, for the antibody-based standards, we actually need large volumes of serum to be able to purify out the antibodies to make those. So in conjunction with CEPI, which is the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Initiative, um, working on trying to develop the vaccines, there's large cohorts of patients that are being enrolled to be able to do standards development for the antibody-based assays as well. I think Ellen has a question about the production cost versus price of the quality assured test. Uh, this is Cassandra. I can try to speak to that. Um, the production cost isn't something that we're, we're always aware of. Uh, not a lot of companies won't make their cost of goods openly available. Um, so what we do is take an approach to try to negotiate on pricing that's um, relevant for low middle income countries, but of course this is also applicable at the global and high income country level. Um, most of the companies, so unfortunately right now we're in a very, very much a seller's market and there are certain nations that are choosing to pay high prices to access different uh, commodities, including diagnostics. And so it's very difficult to try to negotiate down on price when there's long queues and orders of over 10 million or you know, 20 million coming in at the top notch price. Um, but we're, for our, for our intents and purposes, FIND is working very closely with WHO, with um, CHI, the Clinton Health Access Institute, um, Unitaid and Global Fund to be able to try to get to some long-term agreements with these manufacturers to one, secure the fact that they would have a subset or a percentage of their supply made available to low income countries. And then also to supply, to aggregate the demand so that we can actually have a better price through volume. So uh, we're essentially hearing that anything less than a 10 million order is likely not going to get any kind of a price decrease and uh, may not even get processed because the, the sheer volume of orders coming in from countries um, they, I, we've been told specifically as well that they won't, some manufacturers will not fill our orders for our evaluation purposes because they're too small. They have such a huge demand. I have it's a follow-up question. I have a follow-up question that might help answer um, Ellen's question because I, I think it's also useful on that kind of same idea of the framework for access to medicines people of understanding uh, diagnostics. Um, the, the production process of the um, antibody test, if I understand correctly, uh, it's based on the production of monoclonal antibodies that then latch on to the antibodies. So for medicine development, it'd be kind of equivalent to the development of biologics. Um, so that, that, that's, you can maybe confirm my understanding, but the, the second point there would be um, on the quality side, if there is a good monoclonal antibody for the, the amino assay that's identified to what extent could that be replicated if you shared the, the information about how that's produced or would it be very uh, dependent on the batch production process? So I guess how much is the batch production process versus the product in uh, determining the performance of the test? And I guess the, the link back to Ellen's question is, I assume that the production of the antibody tests for COVID are quite similar to other tests that we do know the price for. Um, and that while there is supply issues for um, or demand and, and all of that on that, 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 that side shaping price that you're also going to have, uh, th th there's, there's a basis for, for evaluating what the, the test price could be um, at, a, at a large scale based off other uh, disease tests. Um, so I guess it's more about asking confirmation on those points if I understand that correctly. And yeah, this is Cassandra again. I don't want to just hog the mic, but yes, you're correct. Uh, for for the production of the raw materials that have to go into the rapid diagnostic test, the immunoassays, it, it's a combination of what you said. They actually need to have um, access to purified antigen, so part of the virus particle, as well as antibodies themselves. Um, once you know which marker, we call them biomarkers, so once you know whether or not it's this antibody or that antibody that is the best one to use to be able to answer your question, which 
or the antigen, because the, your question is critical. Are you trying to identify patients that are actively infected? Are you trying to identify patients who have previously been infected, but you don't know whether or not they're still infected or immune, or are you trying to answer the immunity question? Those are, are going to be variations on the test, and the biologic component is going to be very particular. Once you've identified that, there are lots of other companies that can go and try and get the same biomarker, um, and they'll produce them in slightly different ways. Some will try to do it more cheaply so they can have a less expensive product. Other ones will do it very expensively because they, they know that process. But there's a whole bunch of nuances that will go around that. So every lateral flow company will use the biologics. We'll use a lot of raw materials that are all going to be consistent between the different tests, but there's going to be some specificities in there in terms of whether they're using colloidal gold, they're using... Um, you know, other enzymes to be able to increase signal, whether or not they're doing something that's fluorescent and then requires a reader. These all impact sensitivity and specificity and, and also change the price and also make things specific. So when we're looking across all of these different manufacturers, and there's over 200 antibody RDTs currently on the market, they're not identical. They, they will perform differently. Um, and even if we all had them take the exact same biologics, they could perform differently due to quality of manufacturing and their approach to how they actually do the detection. So what you said is correct, but it's also difficult because it's not, um, it's, it's not just that you can turn on one pump and then have everybody do the same thing and there are variations. And then on the price side, I think you're exactly correct. So most of these manufacturers that we're talking to um, well, one of the gates that we, we have put through on our prioritization has been to look at companies that already have products in the market that are distributed globally. And so we, we have an understanding of their price scale and we would not, we would not expect, and we're not seeing this, um, you know, where they would have a $5 test for one product. And then now for coronavirus, they've got, it's $500. They're, we're not seeing that happen. So we do have a general ballpark and a feel for what we expect for these costs and nobody has come in. There's been a couple of exceptions that they've come in much higher than we expected, but generally speaking, everybody is, is behaving well. Uh, Emmanuel, could you, could, you, could you elaborate on the thing that you posted on the chat related to uh, Chai's work? Yeah, sure. Um, I just became aware recently that, you know, the, the WHO task force, um, of course, they're trying to coordinate um, the supply of diagnostics and other supplies to all the, the member states. Um, and, and so CHAI, we, as part of the diagnostic consortium, are negotiating the pricing of diagnostics for uh, the supply of these commodities. Uh, and, and this was uh, released in the, in the latest... Um, update of the, in the WHO website. So I was wondering, uh, given that the, the WHO has listed some products, mainly closed systems, which is the Roche, the Abbott, and, and there is an open source platform, which is a primary design. I was wondering if this test will be used for the procurement through the supply chain task force. Um, uh, yeah, so I don't know if somebody from WHO could answer that. Yeah, hi, it's Anita here. Thanks for the question, Emmanuel. Um, from, I'm not directly involved in the task force. However, I do deal with the procurement of the pre-qualified products. So I know um, quite a bit about what we would do um, in terms of procuring the instruments um, because we're already procuring them for pre-qualified products. It's my understanding that they're actually going to um, split the different suppliers amongst the different members of the task force and WHO in particular will be taking a lead on procuring the open system, open systems and that um, between UNICEF and Global Fund, the other more open system, the Roche, Abbott and Cepheid will be um, split amongst them. So WHO will, I think, has got the harder end of the bargain, um, to be honest. And yes, we are closely following the um, the results of the evaluation that FIND is doing, as well as considering the WHO EUL, so the WHO emergency use listing um, status. And so, uh, yes, they if WHO is going to buy them, they will have to be WHO um, EUL. Um, obviously, at the start of the um, pandemic, um, there were products that WHO was procuring that had not yet gone through the EUL. We recognised that they needed to be, um, you know, urgent. Um, 
supply, um, but we're going to now, now we have products that have met EUL and we have many more in the pipeline. I think we have like 20, 30 in the pipeline, but we do know that, that um, the consortium is going to actually kind of settle around, um, I think there might be something like 12 to 15 suppliers, so 12 to 15 different products, a mixture of um, the big um, high throughput um, closed system, as well as the smaller, more cartridge based closed systems, as well as these open um, platforms where we're going to have to procure the extraction kits, the detection, possibly instruments, although we're really trying to take the stance that we don't procure instruments. We're trying to have countries that are able to utilize the reagents on the platforms that they already have. So there's going to need to be a bit of a matching process where if you've got an Abbott system or you've got a Roche, you would be the country that would be allotted reagents um, for that product. If you have a thermocycler and you could um, scale on any of the open systems, you'd probably get that. And so there's really going to be um, a need to match the demand and this allocation, and that's all being done at WHO level from what I understand in our logistics um, program. And then of course, Chai is having more of the role in the um, negotiating pricing and really trying to understand the demand. And so that's why I'm trying to do a global demand and then this matching and then allocation. Could, uh, is there in the WHO uh, or the or the CHI procurement? Is there any uh, are there any standards on interoperability? Well, the open source and Cassandra can correct me if I'm wrong. The open systems um, generally you can use up to three or four different types of thermocyclers, and they might recommend maybe two or three different extraction kits. So the open systems, by the way of them being open, they they're interoperable. Even you might be able to use more than one different type of um, swab to collect the specimen. Um, so they're very interoperable. Um, the closed systems are less interoperable, but that's because you have the standardization, you have quality control, you have fairly high levels of regulatory engagement, which is very different to what you have for the open system. So it's a real trade off here. Um, the open systems, you might even like have a thermocycler in an academic setting, in a veterinary setting, in a food safety setting. So you've got probably got an instrument that could be used, but it's about the trade-offs when you have open source and you're trying to put that assay together. Um, you'll have three different vendors you might be dealing with. So in the end, who does the post-market surveillance? Whereas when you have a bigger system that is more closed and has proprietary agents, yes, it costs more, but then you have... Um, a company that's committed to post-market surveillance that's really going to be able to do something when you uncover results that you think need to be acted on. So it's, there's a big trade-off here. Jamie, can I just here. expand uh, on what Anita said? Because Anita, if, um, please correct me if I'm wrong. From a regulatory standpoint, the laboratory is taking the final responsibility for that product if they are offering a test on an open system or homebrew uh, a test that has been validated in their lab from a regulatory standpoint it's the laboratory that is responsible for the test legally as well and it is their responsibility both to validate the performance and order quality approved reagents I, I just wanted to, uh, just on the, this thing comes up sometimes in, in, in areas of generics where the question would be, um, when, when you have competition and you have prices going down and you have uh, lots of generic competition, uh, in terms of the monitoring, the safety or the liability and things like that for faulty products, uh, people raise concerns about that. One of the uh, revenues that people have proposed for that is to have, um, is to have some kind of a, uh, a fee that was paid by all the generic suppliers that would go into a fund to a third party that would perform some of these things like post-market surveillance or evaluation or control to, to, uh, uh, to, to, to address this, this public goods problem or this regulatory issue of, of addressing the issues of quality. And, um, and, and, and that could also, also be extended if, uh, if you wanted to have sort of mandatory through the procurement process contributions, anything that went to sort of some sort of follow-up R and D that would be used to continue to improve the uh, platform. Francisco, you had a 
Francisco, you had a specific question about uh, technology transfer. James, I'm sorry, this is Cassandra, but I unfortunately need to log off. I have another call that started and they're waiting for me. Well, I think yes, James. I just think every, everyone would, is really grateful for Cassandra's participation. She's really been great. I'm happy to answer any other questions by email or to share any information, so please just let me know. Thank you so much. Fr Francisco? Yes, thank, thank you, Jamie. No, my question is really simple to understand if there are, there are efforts on technology transfer because from what I understood, uh, there's the biggest challenge is production capacity, understanding the, the whole challenges that were already men, mentioned regarding quality. But are, are the efforts focused on, on production and scalability of the existing producers or, or is it being considered to have greater efforts to scale up production? Because going forward, it will be even more key uh, once the peak in most countries are, are faced to open countries, we need to have uh, significant availability of tests. I, I, I think part of the answer to that is, is that I think, I think people would like to see more distributed production uh, and manufacturing capacity, particularly now when you have these uh, controls on uh, export controls on, on, on equipment that people want and the hoarding of equipment. So the idea that you'd have distributed capacity is, seems like a good thing. But I think the question tends to be what, what institutions or entities or bodies are capable of assisting in this area? Because if it's, I, I think in some ways the, the, the patent side is the easy part and the actually transfer of the know-how or building up capacity to actually manufacture uh, seems like a more challenging thing. And it's not obvious who the, uh, who the entities are that have the capacity to uh, assist in that area. Heather, you, you you posted several notes. You want to just just take the mic and just and just share some of your thoughts. Well, I'm I'm not a uh, scientific professional like those who are uh, reporting. I, first of all, I'm just so grateful for what you are providing. Um, I'm an organizer on the advocacy side in the United States, and several questions have occurred to me. One if there's, and I wasn't sure if you were going to address this later in, in the program, but if there are demands that the scientific community uh, on the call believes could be effective in, made by the public or by advocates so that we can support uh, what will be effective in getting the testing and ultimately the treatment to the broadest populations possible. Uh, in the US, uh, we have a main focus around uh, no profiteering off the pandemic uh, and lowering the prescription drug prices. So that's the broad area that I'm looking for. I had questions then about, that in part was asked already of, what's the cost of production uh, so that we could um, make demands about what the final pricing is to make sure that it's uh, at a price that people can afford, um, as well as, is there a, as this call appears to be providing such uh, reliable information, when reliable information itself uh, and reliable testing is so questionable, um, is there some seal of approval or standard that can be promoted? Um, and I wondered, is that already in some uh, existing agencies, whether it's WHO or FDA in the US? So the questions are about what, what would be most effective, your advice for us as advocates? The second is, is there a way, this in part I say was addressed already, uh, to um, assess price to, um, in the cost of production to ensure that price is affordable for people. And third, just as you are providing um, fact-based assessment of what's reliable on testing, is there a source for that fact-based assessment that we should be promoting or calling for? 
Uh, yeah, that, that's pretty good. First of all, we're not providing any fact-based testing. I, and I'm testing, we don't know much about testing ourselves. I, I don't want to overstate our expertise, but the, the, the other people on the call uh, really uh, seem to know quite a bit. Um, but, um, um, uh, uh, it, 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 you know, since, since we're like past the first hour, I guess just having this broader discussion about what activists uh, think, think are, are profitable areas to pursue in terms of, of uh, advocacy is, is probably good to enter this. I know I kind of asked Michael to kind of uh, uh, let us move into the technical thing when he raised this issue earlier from public citizen, but it really is probably why most of us are on the call. Um, I mean, we want to know enough about the technology in order to make, um, uh, you know, in order to sort of, you know, ha ha have good strategic insights. But in terms of the issues that need to be sort of promoted from civil society on testing, obviously everybody wants more testing and wants more capacity, but what are the other strategic areas that go? I, I would say that one thing that's lacking is more transparency on the prices, even though the World Health Organization adopted resolution on transparency of pricing um, uh, and everything on the value, you know, everything on the value change for uh, 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 from everything from patent landscapes to pricing to R and D costs and things like that were addressed last year by the WHO. But that has uh, that is that is not being done right now. I think that the the WHO could do a better job of trying to get governments that are involved in procurement to share information on what the prices of their different things are, and then to people to push more transparency. And I also think that uh, uh, a, a greater push for procurement policy to move more things into an open source uh, vector ma ma makes a lot of sense. But um, uh, maybe I, I'd just like to hear from other people like MSF, uh, Health Gap, uh, different groups that are tagged, different groups that are working this issue in terms of what you think the policy things are. Um, and, and of course, a, an obvious thing would be the technology transfer policies relating to IP from pu public sector funded research. I just open it up for people on, on these um, advocacy questions. Hi, um, it's Anita here. I think on the pricing and the pricing tra um, trace, uh, transparency, I think that there certainly could be um, a request put forward to the UN Procurement Consortium for them to be able to, once they've set the long-term agreements with the suppliers, to be able to publish those prices. Um, generally, WHO's legal department asks us not to share those prices publicly that we negotiate with the suppliers um, because not everybody is eligible to use um, the WHO's procurement system. But I think in this case, you could certainly make the case. And even having price transparency is better than, than none at all. Um, understanding what the consumables um, cost. So what we've seen is it's not actually the cost of goods that's so much a problem as much as the cost of um, basic consumables has gone up. The cost of air freight has gone up 30% because the flights have gone down. So we can certainly get tra um, transparency around what is the cost per test of extraction reagents, detection, um, cartridges for closed systems, and that would be useful. But then understanding what swabs cost, what buffers cost, all of these sort of things, and then understanding what um, other um, freight issues. We know that um, a WHO shipment to 73 countries was recently refused because the reagents had to go on dry ice and dry ice is quite a dangerous good um, and it's very expensive, but it's what you need to do to keep the test frozen. Um, eventually Ethiopian airlines uh, through um, the African Union were able to accept um, that shipment and get the products um, on a solidarity flight to a number of countries. So that's also something to think about when we're thinking about whether or not price is, and cost is the driver of lack of access, is that it's, unfortunately, diagnostic, it's not just the test device itself, it's everything else around it. Uh, sorry, Sa 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 Safato, is that how I say your name? Do you have a question? You wanted to make a comment about a need for push for more manufacturing capacity in Africa. Do you want to uh, elaborate on that? I, 
I think, uh, and, and Terry also uh, raised this question of local manufacturing. I think, do people have insights they want to share in terms of the, the uh, aside from the IP issues, which are very important, but aside from the IP issues, in terms of other types of support for local manufacturing, um, uh, if, if people have you know, suggestions of where, that, where the capacity exists uh, to do that sort of technology transfer and know-how and things. Uh, Brooke, yeah, go ahead and, and, and you, you, you raise your hand about the uh, health gaps uh, positions and views. So uh, I think the, the concerns we have fall into three main categories at this point. Um, one would be, are the proprietary cartridges and reagents and and, and testing costs, you know, what, what is their relationship to actual cost of production? And, and unfortunately, I, I, from this call, I think we're still somewhat in a situation where we don't know baseline costs in the same way that Andrew Hill has been able to tell us about costs of manufacturing medicines. I, I, I have a sense we still don't have a, a terrific idea about costs uh, in the diagnostic space, but I think we can expect to, to, to think that there's a pretty good uh, profit margin built in, particularly on the proprietary systems and the, and the especially the closed system. So that's one issue. Can we can we make credible demands as, at this point for lowering the costs uh, of the proprietary uh, systems? Um, a second issue is, I think, related to the question of well, can we expand capacity of Manufacture, particularly uh, of closed of, of the cartridge systems, and, and will there be cost? Will it be both potentially cost savings from doing that, but more significantly, quantity increases uh, of that are, can be used in low and middle income countries, um, and you know that that really goes into the technology transfer issue that that Jamie raised, and that I think have been raised by a couple people in in the chat as well. But I think a third issue is that um, we're actually seeing a very narcissistic, nationalistic response to the existing supplies. And, and basically, America first is what we see in the US, but it's got its counterpart in other countries that are uh, you know, interrupting the supply chain, uh, putting restrictions on export, or probably more significantly through grit, uh, through, uh, some of their uh, investment agreements uh, and also just their buying agreements, they're basically running to the front of the line and, and buying up available uh, resources. And it's gratifying to hear something about efforts that are being made to uh, organize uh, the global system to actually get resources to where they're needed, testing kits to where they're needed. But it seems to me we, we ha might have to have a much stronger campaign focused on equitable uh, access, not just who comes to the market with the biggest purse. Hey, Jamie, I had a question. Um, I'm wondering if some of the, the technical folks on the call uh, have any suggestions of people who have that experience on like the manufacturing side. I know in Access to Medicines, um, people like Joe Fortunic and, and and Andrew Hill and the, the kind of team that they put together has been so useful in providing insights um, on prices, but also um, how processes are done. And maybe some of this conversation would be um, could be pushed forward if, if if we could identify some of those issues I've been working on um, on manufacturing of reagents of, of cartridges um, at, at at various companies and might be. A bit more civil society oriented, uh, and that they could provide a kind of independent uh, perspective. You know, what, 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 one thing we might want to think about is, is a follow up call where we just had a lot of manufacturers on the call. Um, uh, you know, just people actually from the business, which we did not do a very good job in terms of recruiting for this call, but I think that would be, um, uh, might be, it might be, if we did a follow up call, it might be good to, to have one where we had a, a pretty good presence of people in the manufacturing side. 
Um, hi, it's Terry. I, I'll just, because Cassandra is not on the call anymore and um, I was working with, with Find uh, when I was still at MSF on, on open systems and pricing and so on. Um, what I can say is that it's very difficult to get the information because it's always considered proprietary and, and anti-competitive to have the information, not only on the pricing, but also how many platforms are in which countries and the uh, extent of their use in country. Um, and also the, um, b because there's already been a lot of great work in the acceptability of pricing diagnostics when they come out for low middle income countries, especially low income countries, for example, a test would be launched at $20, not at $100 these days. Your margin, when we've looked at estimated cost of goods with um, companies that can actually estimate these things, um, you're, you're probably dropping, and, and, and again, this is very volume based. So when, when tests are first launched with very low volumes, the manufacturing cost is much higher, the, the cost of goods is much higher than when you scale up to extremely high volumes. So there are these volume thresholds that need to be built in for price reductions that include the upstream pooled costs across the menu. So for example, if, if a manufacturer is producing 20 different tests on the same platform, in, whether this is cartridge based or lab based, much of the upstream costs can be pulled across that. Everything that is not very specific to that particular um, target for that pathogen is actually a pooled cost. Um, but you're still not looking at, like for drugs, you for hep C you would have a thousand bucks a pill, and when the whole regimen is, is not going to cost you more than a hundred to cure someone. With diagnostics, you don't see that humongous drop that we that we would um, push for, for for drugs. So, for example, you'd fight for a decrease from twenty dollars or ten dollars down to five dollars, which is still something, but the margin is so much smaller. And so, getting the right estimate for cost is even more expensive because what you're fighting for is a few dollars. It's a very small. Um, decrease comparatively so we really have to get it right and with uh, you know with so many unknowns in calculating the, the cost it makes it extremely difficult to to know precisely what to push for um, that is part of the problem and also to know what volume based discounts to push for which is really Im important when we get to pool procurement because if we can get these um, volume-based large pool procurement me mechanisms uh, in place, such as what happens with GDF, um, then I think we, we can have a better negotiation in terms of pool procurement from multiple countries based, based on volumes. It, it, just because of the, uh, the massive role of governments in terms of the uh, acquisition of costs uh, of test, test r r right now around the world and the, and the huge scale up that's going on, it would seem that having uh, some standards for way procurement's done on issues of uh, transparency of prices, uh, but also uh, uh, expectation of transfer of know-how uh, on test in order to really accomplish that, particularly when, if you, when you work in a lot of areas where even aside from the prices and the inequality of access uh, and the uneconomics of widespread testing from the price, you just you can't even supply the market. You, you know, they just have capacity constraints. So it seems as though uh, this would be a good place for us to really uh, hone our, sharpen our message in terms of, uh, of, of, of what our ask would be and, 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 um, and then really lobby governments to, to, to work together so that you know, if, if all the governments are insisting on transparency or agreeing to transparency, one of the things that happens, governments say, I'm not going to be transparent because then I'll get a better price if I'm not transparent. But collectively, you know, it really is a train wreck. And then the other thing is that, and asking for some kind of forward looking technology transfer of know how is really important. Um, and it's not something that one one company doing procurement is really, or one government doing procurement is going to really benefit from. But it, 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 collectively, they have massive procurement power, and no one's really in a disadvantage um, if they're all agreeing that they're going to sort of ask that there be more, more, uh, more know-how transferred. I mean, the the 
the problems of, of getting access to the existing technologies for protective equipment and diagnostics and stuff like that in, in, in developing countries is shocking. And it's just, it just means that there really has to be an effort to, uh, to decentralize a lot of the manufacturing capacities. Um, uh, there's, there's several people here that have, I know they're following things. They haven't, haven't said too much. Matthew Lane, I see you. I see uh, people from MSF. Is, is, uh, I know that there's someone from MSF that's on the call that's done a lot of work on, on the, uh, you know, on, on the, the gene expert a point of care device, for example. I think, uh, uh, Stin, are you, are you available? Yeah, I'm in the call. Sorry, I was a bit late. I could only follow the last. Uh, 20 minutes so um, so it's most has been said already and it's it's mainly about the transparency so what what we have been mainly looked into the stuff uh, gene experts uh, cost of production for the for the TB cartridges together with Terry um, before um, and yet yeah, it's very difficult as Terry said to to get good estimate of a cost of goods so so we have done that for the gene expert TB cartridges uh, based on a consultancy uh, company who has done it for us um, and for for instance for the MTB cartridge um, which is now sold a little bit below uh, 10 US dollars uh, for uh, for high burden countries uh, the cost of goods actually was below five US dollars and this is an estimate of course and 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 Cephid doesn't agree and they say okay it's just inaccurate but they don't back up their claims they don't say their cost of goods so I think it's very important to think about ways how companies can be forced actually to, to be more transparent on the cost of production, uh, but also on the volumes they sell, because as Terry said, it's, it's based on, on volumes and, and, and volumes are the main drivers. And it's very difficult to know even the volumes that are sold by uh, companies in general. Um, and another point is, is on, in, in as, as you James said, that, that uh, for lobbying with governments to to push on, on on these transparency, I think we should not forget also the public investments by governments into the R and D of of many of of these systems. So, um, and there should be, I think, some reflection on 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 how much um, governments or or, or or the communities get back. Uh, from the funding so for instance if there are agreements between public funders like barda to to companies that at least there is some uh uh embedment of 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 uh, of, um, of the investments and and what uh, and some access related articles in in, in such agreements so it's a, i think it's it's ba it's transparency mainly and we have done this cost of goods analysis to force actually to be more transparent on the on the cost of production for the for the gene expert, which is in many countries the only test available for for TB, and it's still sold at at at, at, the, at the same price as almost ten years ago. Um, so that's a bit in a nutshell uh, what we are are doing and still continuing the the, the work, and and it would be very good to have reflections also on from the legal side, from my uh, from IT side, and, and and how we can push actually for more transparency in, in in cost of goods, volumes, and also in, in public investments. Uh, in, in terms of the public funding, uh, uh, the, the, the Chile uh, House of Deputies, uh, uh, a, a, a member, a committee in the Congress in um, Ecuador, and uh, the president of Costa Rica have all asked the World Health Organization's uh, R&D Observatory to collect and publish information on R&D costs on the COVID related technologies, but also including the uh, public sector subsidies. Now, when the uh, WHO R&D Observatory was set up during the, um, the process of looking at these reforms in R&D financing and things like that, a lot of things that people really wanted um, uh, didn't make it through the process. It was really a disappointing end to this long negotiation, but the, the supposedly the, the one bright point we had was we're gonna have this R&D Observatory, which was gonna be, uh, uh, providing data on R&D costs and R&D flows and subsidies and things like that. But it's really been a, a huge disappointment from our point of view. And um, so I, I, I think we need to redouble our, our efforts because it's an existing institution with an existing mandate that's underperforming at WHO right now. I mean, I hate to kind of 
be too critical of WHO right now because the Trump administration is being such a jerk about the WHO. But I think we can still press the WHO to step up on the RD observatory uh, because if, if, if like MSF publishes information or Health Gap or KI or, or IMAC or you know, any of the other groups that work on these issues, uh, it's one thing. But if it comes from a UN agency or government, it tends to have a lot more throw weight and a lot more credibility with people. So um, uh, the downside is if the R&D observatory just starts like, you know, um, just publishing, uh, you know, industry consultant reports and putting their name on it, you know, or, or endorsing them, th 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 then it's even worse, you know, but like, ideally, you'd get them to put out fairly objective data and to collect data and you get governments to actually cooperate and share information. I know that Mano has been tracking the um, the procurement uh, or grant proposals that are going out with a lot of countries that related to COVID-19. And there's tons of them that have gone out from uh, uh, from European countries as well as the United States on diagnostics right now. Uh, I think I, I shared earlier this link on the, uh, the BARDA uh, list of uh, their portfolio on diagnostics, which is pretty interesting. And um, uh, and and, and, and that, that doesn't include what's happening in the Department of Defense. That doesn't include what's happening at CDC, FDA, or NIH. That's just one, one, one federal agency. And we don't have a good collection of what's going on in, um, what's going on in terms of uh, uh, other, other countries, really. And, 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 and the WHO would be, they should step up in this area, I think. Anita, what? Yeah, uh, look, as a WHO person on the call, like I am more than happy for um, there to be more attention um, for diagnostics and devices. Obviously, I'd really like it if the language is a bit more supportive. But just as an example, I don't know how many of you know, we recently split our department into a department that works on more the access issues, which is called health, product, health products policy and standards, and another department which is regulation and pre-qualification. There's just one person who works on medical, two people that work on medical devices um, in the access department and the rest of the department is working on medicines. So please do say if you want WHO to be taking an active role on diagnostics and devices, it's a very specific speciality. And with all due respect, we can learn a lot from the access to medicines world and, and we do keep up with that literature. But what we find is that though these a lot of what we've been talking about today, and a lot of you I've been trying to have, you know, bilateral chats with about the different drivers and trying to understand what we can do, but we don't get on the table. So it's very hard to get traction internally. Um, we'd like to be able to increase our, we have one person working on regulation medical device, you know, one person on access, one person on essential diagnostics list in a department of 300 people. So it's clear that we're obviously on the inside trying to um, improve what we can do with what we've got. Um, but we'd really like the community also to be able to come and say, look, actually COVID is what's shown us or whatever it might be that without good diagnostics, without testing people, we're not actually going to be able to, you know, have the impact that we need to. We don't have medicines, we don't have therapeutics, we don't have vaccines, all we've got is diagnostics. The same thing happened with Ebola actually. And I thought Ebola would have been something that would have spurred <laughs> diagnostics along, but it just hasn't. And we're gonna have this the next time we have an outbreak of something, because we will have, and the next and the next. So let's take this as the opportunity to think about what's appropriate for diagnostics, what lessons we can learn. There can certainly be transparency around um, some of the contracts that are being negotiated cost of goods work. But when you go into the literature, you don't see any academics working on the cost of goods of diagnostics. It doesn't seem to be something that's so interesting to people. So this is the time. Um, and we're more than happy if any of you want to reach out to us and have a discussion with the people in WHO um, and to try to make this happen. That's really, really great. And it's great to have an advocate with all these things within WHO. Uh, Luis, uh, uh, from Chile, uh, you, you had a comment on uh, competition policy. Could you elaborate on that? Well, I, I well, Luis, uh, Luis uh, could, could you could you first introduce yourself? Or I don't think you know. Uh, I don't think everybody knows you. No, I'm Luis Villarreal. I head an NGO in Chile, and we work on IT. 
and in the access to knowledge and now in access to medicine and and my background, I was an IP negotiator for Chile and a member of the IP Court of Chile. So, so, so my, uh, my concern is that current competition law uh, pr provides restrictions to companies to share information with, with regard to the cost of production or, or the prices or the volumes with other uh, competitors. Uh, so I'm concerned that uh, this pooling of uh, information, uh, it might uh, in, in somehow uh, in some jurisdictions uh, be uh, forbidden by competition law. So uh, I think that we, we should take a look also on these norms to, to make sure that uh, we, we, uh, you know, companies are not facing risk when they do give us the information that we need. Rick, you wanted to make a comment about uh, um, the regulatory issues. Well, we, we can come back to, uh, to Brooke uh, later on his, on his question. Um, well, I, I, for some reason, I wasn't. Uh, can you hear me now, Jamie? Yes, yes. OK. so. Um, you know, I raised the, the question of, you know, I, I mean, I think part of the reason uh, there's so much work at WHO to have to do the host marketing surveillance and, you know, why, it, why it's such a problem that, that so many labs end up rejecting some of the tests is, you know, the, the emergency use mechanism, as important as it is in some ways, you know, seems to be, have been calibrated kind of too loose at this point, especially, you know, perhaps in the US. Um, and, it, you know, we find out in the US that it's also subject to um, political pressure, which, which should not be happening. But I, I guess, um, you know, I, I, from an activist perspective, one of the things we would want to make sure is that, that, you know, what's being approved even for emergency uses of sufficient quality. Uh, and so, and that we don't go too far. And we, we may make some mistakes, but we should be making the quantity of mistakes that seem to be made at this point. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think from what I understand, WHO is trying to be a little more measured and maybe a little bit slower in terms of coming up with the priority products that it's gonna help s support and buy. But I wonder if it isn't also uh, a time for activists to kind of jump in a little bit on the quality control um, and approval uh, mechanisms that's being uh, probably too generous at this point in time. Um, a Sissel, do you want to, do you want to weigh in on this? I'm just going with your handle, um, and you just you just made a comment on the thing in response to what Brooke just said. Yes, Afton. Afton. Hi, Jamie. <laughs> I was just responding to what he was talking about, these emergency use approvals and how dangerous they have been, you know, coming from the congressional perspective, obviously U.S. policy has a, a lot of problems and the lack of universal health care coverage and paid leave and things of that nature that we don't have in this country are having a pandemic is exacerbating those problems. But as we tried to fill in the gaps and writing the past couple of relief packages, we made a lot of those policies dependent upon a positive test result. And if we have diagnostic tests that aren't actually working, then people aren't getting the additional relief that they need. And we've had a lot of physicians calling our office, telling us that they do not trust these diagnostic test results right now, that they have patients coming in with all of the COVID symptoms but they're getting a negative test result, but they're also testing negative for the flu and for the other things that they're screening them for. And these physicians are convinced they have COVID, but now we can't get that patient paired with all of the additional programs and resources that they need because we needed that positive test result. Well, you think it would be helpful if we had a, a more in real time evaluation of testing device and transparency that was related to the specific vendor. So we would know, for example, if there's been uh, reports that uh, a, partic a particular test out there is, uh, you know, sort of seems to, uh, 
you know, assuming that someone has the resources to actually evaluate their products, that they're, that, that, that they're substandard. Absolutely. And this is something that Congressman Doggett and Congressman DeLauro a couple of weeks ago wrote the FDA about was being more transparent with this data, making sure that they're collecting the data from manufacturers, immediately making it public, analyzing it, and taking any appropriate actions that they need to. What, what, what do you think of uh, a user fee on manufacturers of tests to pay for the cost of evaluating the quality? Or is that something that uh, people don't want to do because it just drives up the cost of the test? Um, hi, it's uh, Anita here. Would I be able to step in there? I mean, I think in terms of the evaluations, we already have the find evaluations, that procedure which is ongoing. We have the WHO EUL. We have what FDA and the other um, IMDRF regulators are doing. And you do, uh, actually, I don't think you have to pay for those, but you obviously UnitAid and the Gates Foundation are big um, supporters of this work because it's an extension of pre-qualification. So I think in terms of like, is there enough programs to evaluate the quality of tests? Yes, there are. From a regulatory point of view, regulators will always make decisions about the stringency with which they regulate devices based on risk. And that's very different to the medicines world. So for example, you regulate a HIV test that's used in blood screening much differently than you would a pregnancy test or another sort of medical device. So for the COVID tests, there were decisions made that the benefits of getting products to market outweighed the risk. And so decisions were made about the type of regulatory stringency that was needed. Um, in the European Union, it's self-declared. So it's not even that the product goes to um, a, a notified body to have the data review. So I think it's like, yes, it's political, but it's also from the public. There's pressure to have products. Um, and that's why it's this, this pre, you know, how much effort and resources do you put in the pre-market phase? So the find evaluations, WHO, EUL, FDA, uh, EUA, for example, knowing that that holds up supply. And then how much effort do you put in the post-market surveillance side? Like they can kind of flip a little bit. You can kind of go, well, we're going to get these products registered, get them out there quickly, and then we can start to be, you know, collecting data. And then because we know that manufacturers, when they bring these products to market quickly, they don't have the data. It will take them time to get data, enough data to show with statistical certainty on thousands of specimens that the, the sensitivity is X and the specificity is Y. So again, it's all about trade-offs in devices. It's always about risk versus benefit. Um, and I know that for serology, because it was very clear that you will not be able to use it for diagnosis, they were treated very differently to molecular tests. And in fact, the FDA does not um, review serology tests. They're just cleared to be put on the list. Whereas for the PCR test, there is an element of review. And it's my understanding that WHO, EUL and FDA do share the results of their reviews. So there's a collaboration there. Uh, J8, um, you, you get your hand up on Do you, do, you, do you want to just grab the mic right now? Um, Hello. Hello? Yes, yes. Yeah, Go ahead. No, I, I, yeah, I was wondering, uh, again, it's an it's earlier point uh, related to reagents and, and um, this uh, open versus closed systems. So can we, uh, like a... Uh, demystify some of these technologies and put it in public domain say for example how to open and uh, how can you make an closed system into an open system like uh, uh, even the closed system uh, people as happened in Netherlands they are not able to supply some of the raw materials um, like recipes or even reagents so can we um, make these technologies much more open and put it how to make these uh, reagents and how to make these recipes in somewhere in public domain, then uh, at least a few countries where they do exist, some of these industries would be able to easily manufacture uh, with some help from the public funding. So is that technologically possible? I would like to hear from WHO and FIND. Uh, 
Um, yeah, it's Anita here. Uh, yeah, we do have a note where we explain the difference between um, open, closed and lab developed NAT test and the differences in serology. I would also recommend you to go to the FIND website, their COVID Resource Centre. They have an incredible amount of data there um, and information about the different types of tests. Some of you might be joining the ASLM weekly seminars. We've had each of the major manufacturers present their products and Cassandra gave an excellent presentation on the first of those COVID seminars where she explained and she just has it in very simple table format. So perhaps I can send the links to the um, Zoom organizer for today um, where you can get all of those materials if that would be helpful. Do, uh, uh, we haven't talked much about uh, the patents or intellectual property issues. There was some earlier discussion about some of the issues of uh, know-how. Um, uh, oh, first of all, uh, Menno's asking if uh, Safia has a question um, uh, or Dr. Uh, ne Nabini from South Africa. Just want to make sure that everyone that has been on the call that's asked to speak has an opportunity. Uh, or uh, Joseph from NYU, As Asmund son. Do you are you uh, Joseph? Are you are you able to take the mic right now? Well, jump in if you if if if, if you can. Um, um, so I, I, getting um, getting back to the to the issue of of, of I mean we have talked a, a, a little bit about the, the know how there was this action in the Netherlands which um, I don't know if are people here generally familiar with what happened in the Netherlands where the uh, the pharmacies wanted to do their own test and they needed some know how from uh, Roche and there was a uh, uh, intervention by the Competition Commission, or at least a complaint to the Competition Commission in the European Union, and then uh, and then Roche was sort of forthcoming with the know-how, and so that was a case where the issue of know-how and trade secrets, I guess, uh, was uh, basically addressed as a competition issue, and uh, and the Netherlands has really been hammered by uh, COVID-19 in terms of uh, they have a very high raw death rate and a very high rate of uh, deaths per capita uh, in the Netherlands. Um, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and they're one of the countries that's been the most activist that's sort of pr promoting the idea of, uh, of open pooling of technology and patents. They're one of the, the, the countries that stepped up and has offered to be one of the funders of a WHO pool on, uh, on uh, uh, rights and uh, technology, patents, know-how, biological uh, uh, resources, things like that. So that, that, that's been pretty interesting. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, I know that uh, there was a uh, a lot of issues about compulsory licensing that are bounding about. There's been a uh, an effort to try and get countries that have opted out of the w, uh, WTO agreement uh, on compulsory licensing as an importing country to reverse their position. There's 37 countries that have said that even in, in the case of a pandemic or a public health emergency, they would not import um, diagnostic test drugs or uh, or vaccines that are manufactured under a, a compulsory license, which is really uh, um, a bad position for them to have taken. There's some countries that have said that they 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 uh, are, are interested north and south, east and west, are interested in doing compulsory licensing on uh, patents. I think at this point, the countries that have made the early moves on compulsory license, and maybe Luis could elaborate from Chile, and and, and on what's going on in Ecuador and other countries, or or uh, or uh, Luis Abinader about what's going on in the Dominican Republic. And we, there's also been some action in Canada, Israel, and, uh, and uh, Germany. But I think what's holding people back is they just don't know which patents to go after right now because they don't know um, which, uh, which patents are really important for them to, uh, uh, to issue a compulsory license on either for drugs, vaccines, or, or diagnostic tests. But I think that uh, uh, the, the insistence should be that there should be no monopolies in a pandemic and anything that, uh, you know, I, I think that could be just kind of a, a simplified demand from uh, uh, the, the, the NGO communities that there, this is an extraordinary situation. There shouldn't be any monopolies. 
uh, there's not enough of anything that needs to be done and needs to be provided. And all measures that be put on the table that should be uh, designed to promote uh, more capacity, lower prices, and more competition should be uh, considered. I don't, I don't, I don't know if this, I, I, I don't think it's anything really shocking about what I said to most people on the call here. I think that sort of reflects sort of a probably assured view of a lot, you know, quite a few people on the call. But if, if people have want to elaborate on these issues or add additional detailed information about what's going on in particular countries, to be useful. Maybe, maybe. Uh, uh, um, Jamie and Terry, I just wanted to say that, especially for diagnostics, there's there's few true blocking patterns anymore. The sort of main patterns on PCR and uh, immunoassays and and the um, lateral flow design, etc. Um, it, it's hard to find blocking patterns these days. And so I agree with you. I think the simplest and, and most effective route would just be have a blanket rule that you should not have monopolies on technologies that are publicly funded, that, uh, you know, are, 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 are necessary for public health use, et cetera. Because if we start, if, for diagnostics, I can tell you that if we start trying to identify very specific patterns, it's not going to be very effective. So in, in that respect, uh, you think it's more, uh, you think the monopolies are more related to uh, know-how or, so you don't think that the proprietary designs of the cartridges and things like that? Oh are... no, for, for sure it is, but to try and, uh, to try and find a specific a specific handful of blocking patterns it's not going to be easy to solve the the pattern the compulsory licensing the compulsory licensing targets rather i would say i agree with you that we need a blanket rule about patents and by extension access to know-how and trade secrets that can be uh, as 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 blocking in terms of access to innovation as actual IP. Um, yeah, and and access to the how important in that respect are access to the um, biological resources. Um, so it depends what it is. So, uh, for example, if it's a monoclonal antibody that comes from a cell line, a hybridoma then it may be important to access the hybridoma. But in other cases, it may be technology that can be um, with the know-how and, and trans technical transfer, be able to be produced locally should resources be available, such as in, in many countries, like I mentioned Brazil before, um, would be able to do local production. So it just depends on what you're talking about. There's many different technologies that would be needed. Francisco, followed by maybe Luis. Uh, Francisco, maybe make a comment on what's going on in Brazil, and then uh, Luis uh, from Chile. Uh, what, what, in any new develop? If if you're able to share any new developments in Chile, and I know that uh, Luis from the uh, from the, um, from our office may be able to make a comment on, on Dominican Republic. But start with Francisco. On Thanks, Brazil. Jamie. I think for Brazil, it's interesting the law bill that's coming up and that has been submitted with bipartisan support from parliamentarians here that basically put up uh, an automatic compulsory license once a public health emergency is declared either internationally by WHO or in the national level by a presidential decree. So it will be valid for COVID but also for uh, new pandemics going forward. So it doesn't require the capacity, show that there's no capacity to, to supply and also there's already a fixed royal, royalty rate so there's no dispute on the amount of royalties to be to be paid and basically the patent office just needs to publish the list of the technologies that are related to to those so regarding what i've mentioned also in the chat uh, the patent office here has published two studies on the one of, on the patents related to respirators uh, and another ones to, to, to ventilators and another one on on diagnostics and then on diagnostics they found that more than 50 patents are still either pending or granted regarding COVID related technologies. So they haven't so far curiously published, uh, publicized any list of the patents related to medicines. I don't know why. Uh, and they have done only for these this two studies for, for those technologies. 
Uh, Louise Villaron from uh, Chile, can you add something about, or, or maybe you're not able to share it, I'm not sure, uh, but what's, what, anything new going on in Chile? Well, uh, actually, uh, we, we are working uh, also in Peru and Uruguay, and we, we are trying to, to have some similar declarations asking for, for compulsory licensing, and as well as trying to move uh, patent reform. Uh, with, with the view of not having to, to have a one by one a patent request and to move something to close to the Brazilian model. And that, that, so, so we need a very critical in, information on, on what are those patent that needed by sector. Uh, so so we, we can show, you know, legislator that this is a, a, a problem. And also we, 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 we need a, Elaboration on on why it's not uh, feasible uh, to do it case by case. So so this is actually a, a call for help for those in the in the call. Uh, we we need that to make the case in 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 these countries. That's it. Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead on the Dominican Republic. And then also maybe mention the, the uh, research note you just uh, published. Yeah, and I have a, a, a more general comment about uh, the patent landscape in the US, uh, which is that if you look into patents uh, assigned to CEFE um, and mentioning the term cartridges in the abstract, they have 19. Roach has uh, 59 patents that mention cartridge in the abstract and Abbott has 76. Uh, I'm not suggesting that any of these patents are blocking, but uh, I think we, we have seen some, some, some patents in, in, um, in, in that part of the component of, the, of these devices um, by, by some of the diagnosis companies. We, we actually took a deep dive into one of the devices, a point of care device that has not been approved for coronavirus testing, but is based on the PCR technique, um, marketed by Roach under the brand name Colas. Um, and the reason why we took this deep, deep dive in on this device is because the patent landscape is very clear. So that, that helps it um, do a further research on the device. And um, it was invented with and developed uh, with the support, with the heavily supported by government funding. We uh, have a research note explaining um, this funding. In total, we, we estimate that nearly 29 million in grants between 2000 and 2012. And in addition to that, uh, over 12 million in uh, government contracts by the CDC and uh, the army and other uh, federal agencies in the US. So heavily developed with government funds, now acquired by Roach, um, and uh, yeah, currently in the market for influenza. The, the literature review that I've, re that I've seen suggests that it could be leveraged for coronavirus testing. Um, and I'm not sure if I mentioned that seven of the, of the 21 patents related to this, to this uh, device are declaring government funding um, as required by the Bayh-Dole Act. And on uh, turning to the Dominican Republic, uh, we are uh, uh, kind of like prepare for compulsory licensing action there. Uh, the situation is a bit different than, than in, in other countries because the legislation in the Dominican Republic allows, quote unquote, any interested party to request a compulsory license request and the emergency declaration uh, has already been uh, you know, declared by the executive uh, uh, branch, which is another of the requirements in the, in the patent law in the Dominican Republic. So the, I guess the, the sequence here is to wait for which are the target for compulsory licensing um, we have not seen any patent that seems to be particularly relevant in the area of diagnosis. Um, there are patents in, in the Dominican Republic for some of the, for some of the uh, treatments 
um, that are being tested, but not in the area of, uh, of diagnosis. So we, we're waiting to see there. Although there was a, a very interesting comment by the Ministry of Health about three weeks ago saying that Roach has uh, a exclusivity, that's exactly the term that he used, um, uh, on testing in the Dominican Republic. My interpretation after some research to figure out what the, he actually meant by saying exclusivity is that Roach has one of the large automated uh, devices, the COVAs, um, in the Dominican Republic. And so the cartridges that, that are imported or are available in the Dominican Republic has to be used only by this device that is also manufactured by Roach. I think that's, that's what he meant, um, but there's not a lot of clarity on what is that supposed exclusivity that Roach has. And um, so, yeah, uh, there, 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 there has been some activity similar to Chile and Ecuador in the Dominican Republic. There is a resolution file in Congress. Uh, it relates mostly to, uh, to, to the proposal by Costa Rica for the creation of a pool. And he has languages, language on diagnosis tests. Um, it, 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 it has not been subject to a vote because the Congress is not in session, but the legislator that proposed this resolution, uh, Congresswoman Gloria Reyes, she also sent a letter to, to the Ministry of Health and she has been on, on, on the press, uh, you know, calling for, for access to, to technologies in general and she has been mentioning testing too. I, 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 I uh, we, we told people this was going to be a, a two hour call. And uh, I think a lot of people have uh, uh, given us a lot of time. I, 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 what I would like us to do is, is to bring it to an end, uh, just because uh, everyone's got other calls they have to make and things like that. And this is sort of strict to our original proposal. But I think, you know, uh, th this was a, I hope, I hope this was a useful exercise for people. And, uh, and and we give us a better idea of what we sort of need to focus on. I think all this a lot of the emphasis on on sort of practical information about about know-how, trade secrets, uh, and manufacturing has been really important, as well as uh, the, the discussions of uh, um, the evaluation of the efficacy of the test. We didn't really have enough time. We didn't really spend very much time on talking, uh, elaborating on the government uh, role in funding the research and development on that. But I think there'll be more follow-up on that shared with people, um, you know, and on the you know, in the listserv and things like that, because I think everybody knows it's really significant. The money's just really like ramped up right now in a big way. Um, uh, and we can come back to some of these issues of uh, technology transfer and things like that. But if, if I can sort of get a takeaway, I think one thing we should try and work for it is sort of a, in the short run is, is some kind of a joint position among people as, re, as regard, uh, or you know, at least messages from different people to the people involved in the joint procurement about the standards we want to see in procurement uh, on issues of transparency and whether or not, uh, to what extent we want procurement to move things uh, into more uh, technology, in, into more um, openness in terms of the technology and the know-how. Um, uh, but we can't really, I can't really sum up everything because it was too rich of a discussion. But um, if, if anyone wants to say any, anything right before we close, th this would be a good time to uh, take the mic. Get kind of a nice message there in the chat. That's good. <laughs> um, we got some chats from Mo guy. Didn't really hear her talk, but uh, um, um, so I think I'm going to be ending the meeting. If there's no no uh, nobody objecting to that right now, I'd like to thank everyone for spending so much time and and, and having such a great contributions.